Good morning. I'm glad to welcome everybody who has come here, who has come here to attend our roundtable. And the uh, roundtable, our topic is Russia, creation of future world order. My name is Andrei Kavikov, and uh, I'm going to be in charge. I'll be the moderator. Prior to the beginning, I want to say a few words about our timetable organization. So our organization will be as follows. Uh, we have one and a half hours for the round table, which is 90 hours. The number of experts which we have invited is seven persons and uh, seven speakers. And uh, so there would be some introduction, as you would also appreciate. Uh, so it's about 10 minutes per capita. I'm also planning to have two rounds of uh, uh, presentations so that each uh, participant can have uh, two opportunities to speak. And uh, so this is uh, two times five minutes uh, each participant will have a chance to speak. We also have here such a device, and I will warn you that uh, you have one minute only left. I will click and you will hear it. A ding kind of and uh, and uh, the second signal will indicate that your time for presentation is over and we have very strict uh, time time constraints so please ha uh, have understanding to that and uh, as you have to stick to the timetable that we have agreed on and uh, now a few words on it would be kind of an introduction to our today's topic I recall about a quarter century ago, there was a concept of the end of history that was uh, proposed by uh, Francis Fakuyama and uh, from the very beginning of uh, his uh, publication, which became world-renowned. Uh, uh, as many other people, experts, it seemed to me that this concept was absolutely false and uh, because um, st strong Russia has always been a stabilizing factor in world policy. However, departure of the Soviet Union from the world arena did not re remove the tension. On the contrary, it turned out to be the destabilizing factor for the world policy. In the meantime, um, most uh, critical elites, uh, the departure of the um, competitor, geopolitical competitor, proved to be um, a kind of a uh, uh, reason for proposing a single pole world and the imposition of new rules of the game on the world in which uh, only one country has the right uh, of rule, so to say, and uh, it was uh, it was military adventures, and the purpose of that adventure was establishment of democracy, alleged establishment of democracy, which had to justify many ceremonial interventions in many in many countries' affairs, which was followed by carpet bombing and bombardments and the physical removal of unwanted politicians and state leaders. And the U.S. began to interpret international law as on their own, and uh, they began to determine what, what uh, falls under the category of such norms and what isn't, what kind of waters could be reshaped and which couldn't be reshaped, and they began to divide terrorists into good guys and bad guys, and, uh, and uh, the institutional principles for the world order that were established following the Second World War were well, thereby brindled uh, uh, on foot. And, uh, but this uh, world didn't happen, and it was impossible for it to materialize. And the horizon, we could, uh, everybody could see, as I could see it, it was a bipolar construction, came into shape, and uh, China was arising, and uh, in spite of certain stability, the construction of the world was still conf confrontational uh, by its essence, and this construction was fraught with serious conflicts, original and uh, world level. Besides, as it seems to me, Bipolar construction could not be satisfactory either to Russia or to any other country that uh, claims to play an uh, independent role and uh, that has serious ambitions, uh, at least in the regional level. We can also mention India, Iran, Turkey, Brazil, and many other countries. The world needs uh, multipolarity, and it is uh, sort of um, ripening, let's put it this way, or maturing. and. Uh, um, and uh, and uh, the departing uh, global uh, 
hegemon as the United States, uh, and uh, contrary to the uh, opposition to multipolarity, uh, which uh, China, on the one hand, is supportive of the multipolar, multipolar principle, on the other hand, it uh, applies it in order to establish its own might and to sort of oppose the U.S. And uh, you also can see that uh, there is a rebalancing of forces. And as it happens uh, in such conditions, the norms and the institution of the previous world order are in a critical situation. Is it so? What is in store for us? What are we in for? And uh, how can we see the future? We would like to discuss it all in at our today's world table with our highly competitive and highly esteemed uh, experts. I want to introduce to you today's participants of our discussion. I will uh, begin with, uh, from the left of me, you have uh, Willow Wimmer. He is a uh, former vice president of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly and, uh, for, and uh, former state secretary to the German Defense Ministry, member of the uh, German uh, Parliament uh, of the uh, Bundestag, and uh, he also, uh, where he is um, like a record uh, uh, holder. He was from 1976 to 2009. Now, Gimitan is a Swiss politician, uh, press of Swiss-Russian Chamber of Commerce, he is uh, also he is also well known in Russia owing to the fact that uh, a little while ago his book was translated into Russian and we'll speak about that book too. It uh, was uh, extremely successful in Russia. And uh, Emmerich Chapron, he is a member of the European Parliament. He is a well-known professor in geopolitics, a professor of uh, many uh, universities. Uh, on the right of me, you can see one of the veterans of uh, our diplomacy. Uh, he is a plenipotentiary, extraordinary plenipotentiary and assistant to the international affairs of the Russian Federation, ambassador of Russia to Denmark and to, from Russia to Uzbekistan. And among other positions that he occupied is Dmitry Rurikov. Next, uh, sit next to him is on the right uh, is uh, Dmitry Danilov. He is uh, head of the Department for European Security Institute of Europe of the Russian Academy of Science, professor of um, Moscow State Institute of Foreign Relations of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. And uh, Sergei Trifkovich, he is a well-known uh, politologist and uh, political scientist and uh, he is also uh, professor of political international relations. And uh, we also have here Alexander Rar, Alexander Glevich Rush. He is a professor, science director of the uh, German Russian Forum, political analyst, a well known public figure. Let's uh, come to our work now. Now, number one issue I would like to address to, to you, Dmitry Borisovich. That is uh, in follow, following up on the preamble that I uh, permitted to really deal with the uh, breakdown of the old world order and uh, how does it manifest itself, if you could say that. Well, in fact, the breakdown of international world order has not yet occurred and the international world order has not yet been abolished. It is violated, and it is seriously violated, and the leading world player, indeed, is behaving as if uh, it is not the, he is not there. In the meantime, very many parties or majority of the participants of the international relations do not agree with that premise. And uh, what, what we have here is an interesting situation. I think we have to speak uh, more about uh, what world order is all about and what is the new world order all about. The new world order, how can we define it? And, um, and what role this uh, concept can play or should play in our lives. In fact, the new world order is, uh, has, uh, is a concept that has long been developed 
Uh, this is an ideology, uh, this is a philosophy. This is uh, it's a multi-profile project uh, which has been realized, has been realized beginning from the um, uh, 1940s, 1930s. Especially it was obvious uh, in the beginning from the 1960s, last century of course, and um, it includes uh, very many uh, directions, how it could be realized and what we can observe and uh, what uh, most often is violated by the um, existing world order, which is based on the Yalta and Potsdam order, where the states, uh, where the states uh, came to as a result of the most tragic uh, opposition of good and evil. And uh, evil was uh, destroyed, and uh, the, the worlds uh, worked out new norms of relations between uh, each other in the implementation of their interests. Uh, and um, we should you we should also remember how many times uh, all these uh, principles were violated in the meantime. I would like to emphasize and underpin the importance of the existing world order as um, um, as uh, the world order which has not been abolished. And Sergei Yerovlov, he said, um, let us sit down at the round table and uh, discuss how we could observe all the rules of the game of international uh, intercourse that uh, have never been abolished and which are in effect, which are effective and uh, which apply and are applicable to most uh, countries throughout the world. However, recently he also had to acknowledge that the international life rules do not exist any longer. The rules do not apply anymore. That's what he said, and geopolitics, military crisis, and uh, demotion of various regimes, uh, dethronements and whatever, uh, violations of uh, world order, it's only part of the project of the new world order, which, which has uh, very many aspects, uh, many facets, and the new world order also presupposes that that the states uh, won't uh, have uh, more sovereignty, any more sovereignty, any more independence, uh, any more other components of uh, uh, world uh, life organization, and there would be a brand new organization, life organization for all the countries. It will be a, a unified world center, and the, and the life will look absolutely different. And we have been led to that, not only through the original and international crisis, not through the threats of uh, more serious uh, co collisions that uh, we uh, hear about from our foreign partners, but al we, we also have here non-military directions, and uh, we have soft force that uh, also is actively introduced and uh, most, active, uh, most actively uh, promoted uh, in the world, uh, in the West, uh, as well as in Russia, it has uh, achieved quite tangible results. And uh, in the conscience and uh, understanding, it, it became the, um, the, the, uh, the foundation for non-material relations. And many parties, uh, which also takes place in Russia, uh, as in many countries in Europe, uh, that uh, along the line of the new order uh, are, are behave quietly and they have advanced advanced forward. Unfortunately, quite uh, quite far. Thank you very much, uh, Dmitri. You, uh, our very strict uh, timetable. You have met all the requirements. I want to give the floor to Mr. Willy Wimmer. I would like to uh, remember. Uh, Mr. Wimmer, that the day before yesterday, you and I had quite an extensive dialogue, and uh, we discussed preliminarily the topic of our today's uh, round table, and we uh, indeed said that the uh, world order are sort of uh, violated uh, by uh, in, in a most flagrant way, most brazen way, and it's not, not only international, but the law is in general, not only international law. If you look at Today's scandal around the Skripal affair, you understand that uh, there is no notion of uh, presumption of innocence and, uh, and the country can be accused without uh, providing any proofs or any evidence and uh, the other countries do not need any evidence either in order to, to believe the um, accuse, accuse, accusing country and, uh, and uh, use uh, various uh, sharp 
or drastic diplomatic efforts that uh, put the world much closer to almost uh, almost a siege, a military siege situation. Uh, what do you think? Where, where are we going to? Where does it lead to and why the new Cold War that has practically begun, it has taken even a more dangerous turn than it used to be earlier? wonderful and brilliant translators you have. It's uh, extraordinary. Ah, thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I want to congratulate you for the brilliant translators you have, because without them I wouldn't understand anything, and therefore it's better to have translation. Um, to answer your question, I go a little bit back, um, back to the 80s. And it was in 1988 when I visited on a regular base uh, Washington and uh, got special information with all my colleagues from the, head of, from the head of the CIA. It was in summer 88. And in the essence, the message they gave to, they gave to us was, we all know that there is Cold War. But when you look on the military efforts of the Soviet Union in Central Europe, it is just the protection of motherland Russia. It is not an aggressive posture. It is just the consequence of Napoleon and Hitler. That was the message of the CIA in 88. And nowadays, when you look on the European map, you see American, German, and other tanks in the outskirts of St. Petersburg. How must the Russian see us when you go back to 88 and when you see the situation today? The old enemies and allies from the Second World War are now in combination at the Russian western border. I think we have to understand such a picture to be realistic about today's situation, what's really going on, and this is in contradiction to everything which was determined upon at the time of uh, German unification. The basic ideas for being in NATO as a unified country Having only German troops on East German territory, these plans were developed by myself. And without any difference, they became part of the negotiations and the arrangements and the treaties which led, which led to German unification. So I know what I'm talking about because it is my work. And therefore, I think we should be familiar with the overall development in the picture. The second observation. I took part in an American conference on the situation in Europe being organized by the State Department and another institute from the United States. And the leading figure there was John Bolton who now became National Security Advisor of the United States. And this conference took place in Bratislava in May 2000, and invited were prime ministers, heads of state, military leading figures, intelligence from Central and Eastern European countries. And the message was, we promote a different situation in Europe. There will be a wall, artificial, wall between the Baltics and Odessa, and from Odessa to Diyarbakir in Turkey. Everything is, which is west of this wall, that's us, it's American, including the law system. And east of this wall, there might be the Russian Federation or somebody else, but it's, it's not of interest to us. We continue this picture. I wrote, because of the results of this conference, I wrote a letter to Gerhard Schröder, the former German chancellor. I'm a Christ Christian Democrat since birth. 
and he is a social democrat. But for me, the result of this conference was dramatic. When I now look back to 2000, they did it. They did it. And we, as Europeans, face a situation where we are neighbors, and when you go to Moscow, you feel at home, but we are not allowed to communicate as we should do because of this general plan to divide us in Europe. And therefore, I think we should live in these pictures to understand the world. It has nothing to do with the Philippines, the new world order. It's on us what is determined here in Europe. And when you ask me, how do they think about Russia, <laughs> as they thought about Germany in 1914, they don't like somebody who has his own will. And as long as people in Moscow or in Khabarovsk or in Vladivostok think that they have to make their own decisions, it's not in the intention of Washington. As long as you are thinking that way, you are, in a Roman sense, Carthago. Has to be destroyed. And this war will happen on our territory, on yours, on ours, and therefore I think we have, this, we have to take this into consideration. And the third or fourth observation is, last year the US President Trump visited Paris. A good idea, a good idea to go to Paris. It's our heart. But the intention of this visit was to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the US entry into the First World War on the side of France and Great Britain. And that brings us back not only history, one year ahead of the remembrance of the Versailles Treaty. When we look back to the history of our continent, we know what it means if you behave towards your neighbor not in a friendly way. It leads to war. And therefore, I think it is wise of all of us, for all of us, to think about European <coughs> history from the beginning, where everything started. And when you look on the situation where everything started, we have to take Great Britain into consideration. They are brilliant in organizing the war of others. And this might be the situation with the Salisbury Tales. I would like to thank you, Mr. Wiener. It uh, was a, a, you draw a very important historic uh, parallels and indeed invaluable experience that you brought up. It's invaluable in diagnosing correctly the current situation. I would like to turn it over now to uh, Mr. Shaprad. Uh, currently, we are living through uh, some very significant change, uh, significant change in the geopolitical and geoeconomic landscape and uh, the distribution of uh, force. And uh, personally, I, as an economist, uh, uh, conducted the uh, calculations according to which, uh, and uh, they are based on the uh, world known Angus Medicine. Uh, tables, even presuming uh, that there will be a serious uh, fading of uh, the uh, f a serious slowdown in the rate of uh, development of China, uh, they uh, will are going to uh, merge toward the global average. So I think that in a few years, even considering that, uh, China will account for about one third of the of the global production, and at by that time, the share of China in the global GDP will uh, exceed uh, the. Uh, combined GDPs of uh, the United States, Mexico, Canada, and Europe. It will be equal or greater than uh, this uh, combination. So we are dealing, we are looking at a very dramatic change in the distribution of economic power. And until today, history de has demonstrated to us 
uh, the fact that the country who becomes uh, the economic leader, they start uh, to claim uh, certain positions in the geopolitical uh, sense. Uh, we also, we are also observing a very strong growth uh, of India, and they also claim uh, their due from other countries, or at least that's what they think. So I think uh, that uh, the uh, that Europe as, a, as an actor, as an independent and self-governed uh, actor, uh, its position as such an actor or player is becoming increasingly doubtful. And so what uh, would your comment be on that? Uh, whether there will be uh, other coalitions that will uh, reshape our world, how they will affect the future world order? For inviting me. It is absolutely clear, I think, that since the collapse of USSR, America tries to attempt uh, to establish uh, a unipolar world. They want, it is clear that they want a world ruled by the United States. They want to remain the number one in the world, not to allow China to become the number one, so they want to continue to control globalization. To this end, the USA wants to prevent the emergence of a multipolar world that could be based on sovereignties and their interest with specific models and political regimes. Because only China has the demographic and economic capacity to become the world leader. So what are the axes of strategies? of America. I will uh, give you some different proposals, some different points regarding this strategy. The first consists in preventing the emergence of an, in an independent Europe as a power and to extend NATO until Russia becomes part of NATO. NATO's expansion has taken place in step-by-step -step process since 1990, taking the place of the Soviet influence space. Then we have the attempt of NATOization of Ukraine, and that is why Russophobia has been reactivated, this former fear of the USSR, in order to unify Europeans against Moscow. That's the, that could be the first point of America strategy. The second point consists in a circle around China through a network of alliance, reinforcement of an alliance with South Korea, with Japan, reinforcement of an alliance with India, reconciliation with Vietnam. The Indo-Pacific Initiative supported by New Delhi and Washington, aims to oppose to the Chinese initiative of a Silk Roads, supported by Beijing. So the US objective is to avoid Eurasian unity. This means fighting both the Russian Eurasian Union project and the Chinese Belt and Road project. Third point of this strategy, managing China's energy dependence by the reg regime change in the Middle East that consists in dismantling oil nationalism like in Iraq in the past, Libya, Syria and Iran axis, an alliance and to make an alliance for uh, American with Sunni oil monarchies. Fourth point, they would like to reduce conventional nuclear deterrence by using an anti-missile shield. Fifth, preserving the supremacy of the dollar based on the petrol dollar. The dollar must remain the currency of hydrocarbon exchange for the Americans. That means all the dollar to the extreme, but at the moment when the yuan could offer an alternative, shift the world into cryptocurrencies from a global information society dominated by the United States. Six point. They would like to avoid multipolarity in the area of the global information society, while Russia tries to offer a counter model 
of information to Europeans, to Africans, Arabs and Asians, the Americans strongly attack what they call propaganda and manipulation, the objective being to keep the monopoly of information. Seven point consists to take advantage in the world after what we call homo sapiens to homo deus, which is the increased man. This increased man will then abolish the hierarchy of nations and replace it with a hierarchy between a globalized Western and Asian elite and the subhumans, that immense human mass that will not have access to artificial intelligence, to bionics, and to the increased man. And this immense human mass could be the new slaves, of course. So to conclude, as you know, Trump was elected on an isolationist agenda. He was supposed to break with his global project. But the American deep state, the American deep state has disposed all of his advisors one by one and has taken over President Trump. Trump's energy now risks to serve this global project again. Bolton's nomination illustrates the return of a neoconservative's agenda. We want to transform the world and accelerate American domination, taking the risk of a world war. We remember the name of this conservative think tank project for a new American century. In Washington, there is no question of the United States losing its world leadership to China. The American strategy will be the strategy of tension, for sure. The challenge for Russia and for emerging Asia will be not to fall into the trap by bipolarization. And on the contrary, trying to continue to promote a very balanced world. That's the only way not to come into the trap and to continue promoting multipolarity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Shamprad. I think uh, that uh, you, in your brief uh, presentation, you provided a very deep analysis of the key uh, key features and directions uh, of the containment uh, policy that the United States uh, pursues with regard to its competitors on the global arena. In continuation of this topic, I would like to turn it over uh, to Serge Trivkovic. Uh, and, you know, before you start your uh, presentation, I would like to remind us all uh, quite recently, uh, documents have been published, uh, strategic documents of strategic significance. Uh, those documents were published in the United States in December, in late December of 2017. Uh, what was published in the U.S. was a new strategy for national security. And on the uh, 19th of January, a new strategy for national defense was presented by the by James Mattis, uh, the, uh, the new uh, Secretary of Defense. In uh, again, in January of uh, 2018, uh, published was a, uh, a report uh, called "Containing Russia" of the. Council of the National uh, Relations uh, Council, and the topic was how uh, the U.S. Uh, can respond to uh, the Russian uh, challenges to the American domination and po policies and strategies. So I would like to note that the Council for International Relations of the United States is a very influential body that shapes, plays a great role in shaping the U.S. foreign policies, in, in no matter what uh, particular president or party is in power. Also, uh, about that time, a Committee of International uh, relations of the U.S. Uh, Senate was published that dealt with Putin's asymmetric 
uh, attack on uh, the, on democracy in uh, Russia and Europe and the consequences for the national security of the United States. I, I, I'm not even mentioning that uh, following the publication of those documents, a lot of their ideas uh, were included in the annual address uh, of uh, the U.S. President Donald Trump. All these documents uh, are uh, provide evidence of the ultimate escalation uh, and uh, the direct definition of the enemies or foes of the United States, which include uh, whose list includes uh, both Russia and China, and some of these documents are devoted to Russia, are targeting Russia exclusively. And it appears that in new doctrinal ideas, new doctrines are being uh, adopted uh, that quite radically transform the existing situation. So confrontation is uh, taking on uh, very, uh, very dangerous uh, shapes. And what uh, is the situation fraught with? Uh, that's uh, what I would like to uh, pose to you as my question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I wish I could give a succinct and rational answer. And it is tempting to start with the historically continuous tendency of an oceanic trading power to project its might along the rimland of the Eurasian heartland. And at least there would be an element of rationality in explaining that in this sense we have the continuity of US policy with the British imperial policy in the 19th century in the spirit of Mahan, Mackinder, and Spikeman. So far, so conventional. However, the problem is that we also have a deeply emotional, heartfelt, virulent, and, uh, and uh, totally visceral Russophobia on the scene in the West, on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean, which goes beyond any geopolitical, strategic, or conditionally speaking, rational explanation for this policy. So instead of dwelling on the details of uh, the new national security strategy from last December, the national defense strategy from January, what we are looking at is a comprehensive all-round treatment of Russia as an enemy, China also, the attempt to reestablish the concept of full spectrum dominance, and the triumphalist return of the advocates of full spectrum dominance from the Bush era in an even more brazen form, because having been proven wrong with Iraq's weapons of mass destruction and all the rest of their triumphalist agenda from the first decade of this millennium, they are now back. It's as if Trump, the vampire slayer, has entrusted Count Dracula with the blood bank. Now, where does this lead? And I have to say, as uh, a Serb by birth, who has spent most of his working life in Britain and the United States, that I am really scared. I mean, I've known all along that the West has the capacity for irrationality. And in particular, I think that the spectacle of the Western world expressing uh, solidarity with the morons and degenerates like Theresa May and Boris Johnson is simply laughable. But at the same time, I think that we have elements of discourse, of public discourse, which is scary because at least during the Cuban Missile Crisis, you had people like Bobby Kennedy who could meet the Soviet ambassador and they could talk like rational people. Right now, in the positions of responsibility in some of the key institutions of the West and primarily the United States, you have people who are literally psychopaths, who are thinking in terms of fighting and winning a nuclear war. The second problem is that we have the collapse of Europe. The relationship of European leaders to Washington today is comparable to the relationship of Walter Ulbricht and uh, Todor Zhivkov to Leonid Brezhnev 50 years ago. And uh, finally, 
uh, we also have what I think is insufficient realization in this city that this is a long haul and that this is an existential struggle. And my hair stands on end when I hear Russians still talking about our Western partners. You cannot have partnership with people who want to destroy you. They hate your guts. They want you dead. They're not partners. They're plotting your destruction. They want to carve you up. Ultimately, there will be, in their view of things, either a post-modernized Russia, which hates itself as much as the leaders of the European Union hate their own nations, their own past, their own spirituality, and their own origins, or there will be no Russia at all. And in that sense, Russia is not only the last hope for the Russians, but also the last hope for all decent, right-thinking Europeans and their transoceanic descendants. Thank you. Uh, but uh, uh, in some way, uh, <coughs> grim diagnosis of the situation. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Danilov. Talking about the changes of uh, balance of forces that uh, I mentioned in my introductory remarks that also apply to the military balance of forces. Moreover, we, uh, we can observe that in the past decade, the use of military might and in international uh, policy becomes, uh, becomes uh, a greater norm, and we uh, confront the situation more and more often. And uh, it's not a news, of course, in international policy. I'm talking about the use of force, but as it seems to me, this is my opinion that the preceding period and uh, most of the players uh, had some knowledge of limits. Uh, they knew some limitations and they knew some rules of the game, but in the past uh, couple of decades, as it seems to me, there are more and more signs uh, that uh, there, is, uh, there is a game that rules. It's uh, quite a perilous uh, uh, course, and uh, you as a well-known specialist for many years, for decades, you have been addressing the issues of um, uh, safety and security. Um, uh, th this particular scenario, on the one hand, uh, change of uh, military balance throughout the world, on the other, um, sort of um, playing with uh, more and more dangerous uh, uh, armaments, and uh, uh, do you think, uh, how does it threaten international security, and where can it lead us to, and do you see any, any actual trend or uh, vector of development? Well, in fact, I, I also want to, uh, first of all, express my gratitude to the organizers that I have been invited here and to the organizing, uh, to this panel. But uh, in responding to the moderator's issue, question, I would like to go back to some historical uh, facts. Uh, everybody was talking about uh, uh, new history, and uh, I will not be an exception. So, first of all, I would like to I would like to to to, to, to quote uh, a saying uh, which fits our panel, which is Han Fei, third century, century uh, BC, and uh, violation of order leads to chaos, and uh, observe of, of uh, uh, order leads to to, to to quietude, and this uh, order was uh, violated, and uh, but no no new order has come to replace it, uh, to, and. Uh, an attempt to form uh, common spaces that would be based on a common paradigm and in could include the elements of um, non-confrontation by it, uh, fair competition. Apparently, although the times failed, and uh, moreover, I, I would wish to say that I would dare say that uh, essentially the bipolar. Uh, confrontation was not uh, broken down completely. Uh, we still have material fo foundations for the bipolar confrontation, and we we also mentioned uh, how uh, how the, uh, the the main political pillar was um, consolidated. I'm talking about NATO alliance, and uh, uh, what is most important, however, is uh, 
in this new multipolar world, this uh, bipolarity continued to, to act as a political philosophy. We, we said that uh, that uh, the, the game with a zero amount is uh, nothing. Now we have to play with an added value, but uh, zero-sum game continued. It still was the, um, the visible uh, rule, and uh, yeah, but a serious rule too, and it continued to 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 apply, and the the uh, logics of restraint or deterrence continued to apply, and uh, in the past, following the uh, Paris uh, Charter, it still was unresolved, and Europe still is divided, and this uh, division. Uh, lines, um, as it became obvious now, were only becoming deeper and deeper. And uh, uh, we, we also could um, acknowledge that Western strategy was, um, uh, first of all, was is, uh, uh, in consolidating the system of uh, of uh, security through the um, inception of uh, its own stability zones and uh, uh, establishment of its own rules and the expansion of this uh, zone of uh, uh, security and stability and the Russia was ousted out of the system and uh, so today uh, the, the warnings about the seriousness of such a situation uh, have never sounded since the year 2000 uh, but you remember that uh, Mr. Wood was warning about that in uh, in his speech in 2007, he uh, put it very plainly. He said that if we have two prospects in front of us, either we go back to the mutual uh, deterrence, or we will try to create create or form the structures to, of um, co cooperation, coordination. Uh, we failed to achieve that either, and uh, now we are in a situation of a serious uh, political crisis, and. Uh, what the question we have on the agenda is: um, Is it um, is it uh, a new kind of a cold war, a new shape of a cold war? Or I, I I don't think it's important how we call it. We call it a cold war, not a cold war. But uh, what we can see all we can see all the signs. Uh, we can discern all the signs of the cold war. But it's even worse than the cold war because as uh, the the previous rules of the game do not apply any longer, and the system of restraints do not work anymore and uh, mutual confrontation of restraints is uh, transferred to the external space and determining the rules of the game at the international arena. And the third thing I wanted to mention, in contrast to the previous situation, in contrast to the previous situation, the, the actor, vector of uh, detente and cooperation is uh, no longer balancing the vector of restraint and deterrence, and uh, it can evolutionize uh, toward uh, non-controllable confrontation. And in conclusion, I'd like to say that the challenges and risks are extremely uh, great. And uh, what we have at the agenda today is uh, how and whether we can uh, control such military risks under the condition of the uh, uh, building confrontation, because the system of uh, control management, including the institutional uh, system of security, has been eroded seriously eroded and uh, the uh, arms control has been degraded so it is it is not uh, clear how we're going to live in this uh, new world where the uh, the old rules apply less and less and the new rules have not yet been formulated and uh, in the meantime the diplomatic scandals uh, are only diminishing further opportunities and chances uh, that that uh, it would be possible to agree on anything and to discuss anything. Of course, it's a uh, troublesome situation. I would like to, the next question I want to address to Alexander Rar. We have known each other for a long time, and I have always known you as a, as a proponent of conversions between Russia and Europe organization of a multilateral cooperation, the benefits of which are apparent for both sides. In the meantime, Europe, as uh, has been said before, is under dominating influence of the United States, and, uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, sort of following in the wake of uh, the U.S., uh, uh, contrary to its own interests, and uh, only because of the sanctions war. European business, uh, as I have seen this assignment of the Russian Fund of Direct Investment, uh, the forfeited 100 billion euros, and uh, probably there were some other assessments, but still, 
it's uh, tens of uh, billions uh, of euros a year is uh, what uh, what uh, what Europe is losing. But uh, we probably are talking about uh, hundreds of millions of euros. Otherwise, it's not only economic and um, uh, humanitarian factors, but uh, uh, following. I want to follow up on Danilov's. Uh, uh, presentation: Russia and Europe today are side by side, and the and the um, aggravation of relations between them, as uh, the, the as tragic events of the 20th century proved, um, are, are quite perilous. And uh, what is your assessment of the future prospects for Russia to become an independent player, independent actor in the new world order, or will Europe still be in alliance with the U.S. as? Uh, as a unified West, as a junior partner to the U.S., uh, probably it would be a challenge uh, that I'm trying to uh, pose uh, toward you, but we have an open dialogue. Thank you for the, your invitation. I am really glad to be here. At this uh, table, uh, we have a unanimity of opinions. Everything was uh, correctly and said and stated, and uh, in all the presentations, uh, uh, we underpinned uh, the the danger, the dangers we are facing at the podium that we have here in Moscow. It is impossible to to to, to get together in any other European countries, because what we are discussing here today and what I'm going to say here is uh, absolutely politically uh, incorrect and. Uh, and for, for many people, it's uh, clearly unintelligible. And I want to come to this particular issue, to the problem that we live uh, as though we live in two different uh, planets. I, uh, I gather when we, what, uh, what Alexander has uh, said, he remembered uh, Fukuyama, that he doesn't agree with uh, the idea of the end of history, but I believe that uh, it's the most genius idea that has ever been proclaimed uh, with, the, with the minus sign, though, with the negative sign. However, the uh, their idea, better than a liberal economic system, the world will not invent, and it is, uh, and uh, it began to take shape uh, following 1990, and uh, some people will say today that we have a new Babylon uh, that has been built. Other people may claim that uh, we have um, created a new Enlightenment uh, era that uh, created throughout the world no morale, that uh, there should be no alternative to which. And uh, because all the alternatives which are proposed on the table of the world order and the world outlook and the notions of uh, freedom as uh, it is interpreted in the West, uh, by and large, these are the alternatives uh, which are not only obsolete, but will, they can never become, a priori cannot be a, a progressive. Uh, they should be attributed to the past century. And uh, nobody can uh, really, really seriously discuss and, uh, them. And uh, in the West, uh, we have, uh, in, in raw elites of the population, there is a myth uh, uh, that you cannot you cannot have a better life and you cannot have a better comfort than to enjoy today in the West and the way we live uh, basically it's a kind of paradise without God on high and this is the system of values and uh, which uh, which cannot be improved which is uh, kind of perfect and very many people believe in it and uh, I want also to emphasize that as something important on the side of the ideologists of, of uh, organizing a new world order, uh, which is comfortable, beautiful, like 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 a candy. Uh, all the world the mass media are speaking about that, and you have to imagine that in Germany, in France, people do not read Russian papers or Chinese papers, and uh, they do not. Uh, they, it's very difficult to understand for them any alternative point of view, and uh, and all the. Uh, Brain, the thin tanks. Uh, essentially, they uh, they have to uh, sort of adapt this idea, and the mass mass media they uh, they also repeat that they uh, kind of reiterate that they became kind of a new inquisition, a new war party that uh, which that believes that the system of values needs to be transferred to other continents, uh, to other cultures, and whatever and. Uh, it's very difficult to place new arguments in this world when very banal picture is drawn. This world is good because it is higher moral, and the other world is bad because it has bad moral. And uh, 
Suppose we imagined in the past eight years what they write about Russia as the country which is on the other side of the barricade, on the wrong side of the barricade, which does not accept the West development, which has repudiated uh, the uh, partnership that the West proposed uh, in the 1990s and uh, joined the, the camp of those which uh, come with the negative sign. And uh, this is why among the people in Europe there is a uh, uh, such sentiments arise that people something is wrong in Russia, that Russia is acting against us. This is quite a perilous uh, issue, and I want to draw your attention to it uh, so you understand how serious it is. And I think we need to appreciate the seriousness of the situation because we are uh, pouring oil in the fire, and uh, there is a collision between two uh, uh, the diametrically opposite uh, world outlooks and uh, world views and uh, morals and ethics uh, are so different that they can cause a, a serious clash. As uh, in fact, uh, there are two conflicts going on. Uh, the conflicts, uh, the conflict between the values. We can speak a lot about it, but the other conflict is that is uh, the geopolitical one, and we need to have it resolved. I in sp uh, not with the stand in the uh, unresolved value-based uh, conflict. So we need to identify a third uh, way, so to speak, but because of the Ukrainian crisis, uh, neither uh, Europe is unable to think of a third way. So uh, uh, there are demands to Russia to become, that it become uh, a, a junior partner and uh, I think that Europe, considering the, its current leaders and the elites uh, that have been uh, brought up in the transatlantic spirit, and uh, the Atlantic Ocean is not a barrier to them. A lot of airplanes are flying over it, and the connections, the links between the United States and Europe, in terms of their logistics, uh, the U.S. is closer to Europe than Russia. So this transatlantic system will continue to exist, and my view, and of course I can... Uh, uh, argue a lot about that. Uh, well, uh, my view is that we are moving toward a two-block system, a transatlantic system that would fight for its comfortable uh, world order, uh, and they will fight to the end uh, with very tough uh, measures. But then the other, uh, on the other side, are uh, Russia, China, India, uh, Turkish, uh, uh, Turkey, uh, who would try to unite around new ideas in the Eurasian space and uh, the work toward creating a multipolar world. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexander. It, uh, uh, your presentation caused some very interesting thoughts uh, in uh, my mind, and I would like to uh, outline a couple of points here that I was particularly touched upon. A very interesting phrase uh, was mentioned by you that uh, Europe has convinced itself that they are the paradise without a god. Uh, well, uh, well, uh, you know, for a believer uh, to imagine Imagine a uh, paradise without a god uh, would be something uh, impossible to imagine. But my other uh, uh, thought is that uh, such uh, uh, conviction is not only in the minds of the elite, but also in the mind of the common people, thanks to the media and thanks to the daily a self uh, uh, conviction and uh, the west has been able to convince itself that it's the only way and that's the only vision of uh, the fate of the humanity and uh, it brings me to recall uh, that uh, the Soviet Union was too ideological. That's what we heard in the old days. Uh, the Soviet Union was accused of being too ideological, but the world has changed a lot. It looks like we have swapped uh, our places now. Uh, as we can see, the Western world, the world of the West, is losing its ability to see things for what they are. I would like, in, to, in continuation of our discussion, to turn it over to Guy Mitan. Uh, you are the author of a well-known book, uh, which I mentioned at the beginning. In uh, the Russian translation, it is known as West and uh, the West and Russia, a war of 1,000 <coughs> years, uh, uh, the history of Russophobia, 
and why we love to hate Russia so much. So history provides plenty of evidence, and uh, your book is uh, a piece of such evidence that uh, there is a line between Europe and uh, Russia, uh, which has to do with the fact that Europe simply refuses to understand Russia and recognize uh, uh, the uh, Russian thinking and uh, their right to think in a different way. So what influence has uh, this uh, perception has exerted on uh, the historic historic events and on the current and uh, future condition, uh, situation in the world? How will the situation develop uh, in the context of this 1,000 year war between the West and Russia? Very much for inviting me to this event and to give me the floor for this uh, in this uh, forum. Um, it's hard to answer in, two, in five minutes because I think the Russophobia in European West and Western world is deeply rooted in old historical and religious um, history, like this religious religious kiss between uh, West and and uh, between European uh, world and uh, Catholic world and Orthodox. But what I would like to mention for me uh, is uh, that for understanding the current state of the world, the notion of a new Cold War is not the best one. And it also explains uh, why the Russophobia is so deep. The concept of uh, Cold War sounds very well to our Years, but it is confusing and leads to a mi misunderstanding. To understand what is happening nowadays, we have not to look in the recent history, uh, but in the deep past, uh, I mean the Roman Republic, when the Roman Republic was decaying and transforming itself into a world empire. In my view, we are indeed in a period of transition between what we could name the United States Imperial Republic into the new American Empire. The terms are important because the goals, the ambitions and resources of an Imperial Republic are quite different than the goals, ambitions and resources of an empire. The goals of an imperial republic are unlimited, unrestricted. An imperial republic is aimed at a total hegemony over the world. It pretends to impose its moral and political values to the entire humankind, which has not the chance to share its generous views. It was the case of the Soviet Union, which wanted to bring its communist values to the rest of the world, as it was the case of the United States liberal democracy, which wanted also to impose the supposed benefits of its own system to the world suffering under the communist rules. This was the ancient times of the Cold War, which was the confrontations of two different imperial republics. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the US liberal republic has known a brief decade of total hegemony. The neoconservatives and liberal democrats in Washington have briefly thought that they had won the Cold, the Cold War and imposed the liberal democracy and free market economy to the entire rest of the world, as Francis Fukuyama wrote in his book on the end of the history and the triumph of the liberal democracy and free market values. President Bush the first and President Bush the second, President Clinton the husband, and would-be President Clinton the wife, as well as President Obama, were the interpreters 
of uh, the interpreters of this imperial hegemony will. For them, Russia was a big stone in their shoes and they always look to break it into pieces, as suggested by Zbigniew Brzezinski in his great chessboard book written in 1996. But this strategy was not successful. So they tried to submit Russia or to transform it by force, like today with sanctions, economic sanctions, but especially they tried to submit it uh, through what we can call tricky soft power means into a Western liberal democracy and a free market economy dominated by United States multinationals and ruled by a representative of a globalist oligarchy. In that view, the European Union, dominated by good-willing Angela Merkel Germany and new anti-Gaullist, Sarkozyist and Hollandist France, which wanted urgently to join NATO commandment and play the role of the loyal supporter of US interests against their traditional enemies like Gaddafi's Libya or Assad and Assad Syria, so the European Union has been transformed into the proxy relay of the Western value, liberal democracy and free market economy in Europe and Ukraine, but also for the rest of the world and especially in Africa and Middle East. But the election of President Trump has broken these dreams and well-oiled narrative. That's the reason why Trump is so contested in America and why the US Russophobia is actually so high. Trump's election has announced a big shift in the American policy and means the renunciations of the goals of the Imperial Republic. It adds to the goals of a total hegemony of United States on the world into a more pragmatic and convenient domination on a more limited portion of the world. Trump, as Obama did, but more discreetly before him, has recognized the rising of China power and also the re-emergence of Russia. As a given fact, it, he shares the view that the present United States must focus itself on its core territory and zone of influence in rough worlds in Europe, in Latin America, which is completely and totally submitted, all the left governments are thrown away, only Venezuela is resisting, but the other ones like in Brazil has been thrown away and so to concentrate on the core territory of the empire. And Israel, sure, and the Pacific vassal states like Japan, Thailand, and South Korea, and other ones. That is this point which hurts the neoconservatives like John McCain and the liberal Democrats like, like the Clintons and also the Western media like New York Times, Washington Post, and I finished. They cannot admit the renunciation to world hegemony, and they have to make the morning of their dreams. That's the reason why they cannot pardon to Trump who has broken their dreams. I will explain the consequences for Russia in my next. Uh, so thank you for attention. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much. We are already behind the schedule, but indeed uh, our speakers uh, share such important and interesting thoughts uh, that I, I cannot uh, uh, get myself to uh, break their presentations. You know, uh, Mr. Trifkovich, you brought up the topic of Russophobia. To continue the discussion of this topic, I would like to pose the following question. What is the greater component of Russophobia, which is a factor, is uh, the rational element or the irrational element that prevails in Russophobia? And what Russia should do in such conditions to try to mitigate uh, this Russophobia, which is uh, currently quite open? On the whole, uh, the traditional geopolitically rooted form of Russophobia is more typical of the neoconservative hegemonist right, mm -hmm. and that the culture of Russophobia is uh, more typical of the postmodern liberal left. And uh, yet they blend seamlessly together. It doesn't seem that uh, you cannot have people who unite both sides. Mm -hmm. They want to destroy Russia because Russia is too big, like when Madeleine Albright says, it's not fair they have Siberia. They, we should divvy it up. And they want to destroy Russia because Russia is Russia, which is like Julia Yoffe. And uh, actually, some of the worst Russophobes in the West are Russian expatriates mm -hmm. who feel more at home in New York's Greenwich Village or London's Chelsea than they ever felt at home in Moscow or St. Petersburg. They are very often children or grandchildren of the privileged Soviet elites, and they actually de uh, hate Russia even more passionately than uh, born and bred Westerners. But what Russia can do, I'll tell you what, be strong and be very determined. Because any attempt to come to terms with madness means to become part of madness. <laughs> you cannot appease, if you're uh, called Jaime Greenberg, and you want to appease uh, uh, Eichmann, you will not succeed. Uh, the only way for them not to destroy you is to, to respect you and to know if they make it, an, if they give it another try, another 1812, another 1941, that they will pay even greater price than that paid by Grand Armée 200 years ago and uh, by uh, the uh, Barbarossa coalition in 1941. That's the only language they understand. So, and also project soft power uh, to those Westerners who do not want to be postmodernized, who do not hate their grandfathers and grandmothers, who do not believe that we should abolish borders between races, religions, continents, nations, and genders, because the postmodernists thrive on fluid borders. You know, today I am a Muslim, tomorrow I am transgender, the day after tomorrow I'll be Buddhist, and the day after that I will be a vegan. And uh, this whole concept that countries do not belong to nations, but they belong to everybody who happens to be within their borders. That's something we haven't mentioned here. And that's actually the biggest threat over Europe. And so Russia should be the upholder of, I wouldn't say conservative, but traditional values, including above all the fact that we are proud of being European Christian heterosexuals, for instance. Well, I have nothing to add to the applause uh, that we heard after this brilliant uh, presentation, but nevertheless, uh, I, uh, uh, there may exist some other viewpoints on what Russia needs to do. And uh, I would like to uh, ask uh, a very experienced uh, politician, Lily Weber, uh, I'd like to put a question to you whether the West can and of course, I'm uh, thinking uh, primarily of the Anglo-American elites who control the process. So can the West uh, 
by making, uh, by exerting such uh, brutal pressure on Russia, reach its goal? Is this possible in principle? Would Russia agree to forget about its interests uh, to uh, to abolish its sovereignty? And if not, then what the consequences can be? Uh, um, under day-to-day -day circumstances, and uh, we have our ideas as they had been expressed here before. And I just want to bring reality into our talks. And I think the interesting development is combined with Russians, Russian policy of today. When you look into the Middle East, and I go back into the history of my own country. When we started First World War, the Jewish international community had been on the side of Germany. They were in favor of the Kaiser to enter the First World War. This changed in 1916 by the Sykes-Picot Agreement when the British and the French promised a Jewish entity in Palestine. And the result had been that the United States entered the First World War. I go back to this history to enter today's world in the Middle East. Who can bring peace to Israel? The Americans, who started every war, since 10 or 20 years in the region? Or is it perhaps the policy of President Putin to go with the international law to Syria on the side of a legitimate government and to protect this government and to be in a good relationship with Iran? I think when, you, when we look on the Middle East, there is an interesting unique situation in favor of Russia to bring peace to this area and also in relationship with Israel, with Iran and others. It might be a too bright picture which I am now painting, but I think the foundations are all there. And therefore I think it is extraordinary that your president has a six years term ahead of him, because that's a time which is needed at least to try it. And when we look back into the history with the putsch in Kiev, in the Ukraine, when you look on the figures who organized this putsch, all the old families with their origins in Russia, and the intention to go back to into their own Russia from the United States back to Moscow. So I think n nobody talked about Israel or the Jewish international community. But when we want to have an access to peace in the future, I think the key is in Moscow, in Moscow's relationship to the Middle East. Спасибо. Well, thank you, Mr. Weimar, for high appreciation of the role of Russia, which is capable of uh, bring about um, international multilateral uh, settlements and um, a sustainable world. Uh, meantime, we have the question that uh, Mr. Trifkovich raised the issue and uh, it's still there. To me, it still remains. Uh, modes are open. I, I like his uh, very um, uh, rational approach, and uh, I think that we can observe two approaches uh, to the assessment situation for Russia and uh, how to define the uh, line of behavior of Russia in, in front of the West in Russian expert community. These uh, two points uh, of view are very well represented. In this case, uh, I can say that uh, I'm not talking about the most uh, typical, but one of the representatives of such an approach, well-known political expert, Andrei Kartnov, 
He is, uh, he is head of the Russian Council for International Affairs. He, is the, um, he uh, complains that Russia is not capable to negotiate with the West. And until uh, recently in his publications, and uh, more and more frequently, he is uh, addressing that issue. And uh, he, he, he says that uh, we have to reach uh, a negotiated settlement and we have to show as much flexibility as we can. Uh, we have to uh, sort of abstain from um, uh, rigid um, assessments uh, in time. They're quite, uh, I want to give you the names of uh, moderate people and you will understand that I'm not exaggerating the situation. Many people are changing their previous stance showing possibilities possibilities for a more sober outlook, a more sober approach, which requires a more, a more originous in, in uh, upholding your our own position. We can see that in the interviews and the articles of such leaders as um, well known as uh, Skartanov, Sergei Karaganov and uh, Fyodor Lukyanov. Uh, who are associated with the uh, uh, Russian uh, defense uh, policy tank and the, the other people who also influence Russia's approach to foreign policy. I want to address this issue to this question to you, Dmitry Alexandrovich. Uh, Danilov, uh, you have a specific... Uh, um, what is your opinion about that? Uh, which part of the of such uh, arguments uh, need to be recognized as uh, more and more correct. And uh, the second part of the of Putin's presentation, that an expert opinion in Russia and abroad, and it had uh, uh, different angles of, uh, of assessment. Uh, the second part of, uh, of uh, President uh, uh, Putin's uh, address, in spite of uh, uh, the fact that the position becomes more and more rigid in, in time, uh, uh, we should uh, really give a decisive answer, a response. It's not very simple to respond to this query. I think we have to believe from the from the premise that uh, before we choose the way to to follow, first of all, we have to to understand. Uh, Russia's uh, strategic interests. Uh, if uh, we base our policy on interests, then these uh, interests have to be rigidly and uh, uncompromisingly followed. The other issue is um, the ways, uh, the methods uh, that we can apply in order to achieve such uh, such results, and uh, how we can uh, pursue such a policy. Of uh, in pursuit of Russian interests, of course, certain flexibility has to be applied because diplomacy and policy, and it's it's uh, actually uh, they, they they are based on compromise, and uh, but the possibilities for for flexibility under the critical conditions are seriously lowered. Now we have to look at one of the examples. Uh, let's look at the European Union. Uh, in uh, 2016, they issued a global strategy of uh, foreign policy and security, where Russia is attributed only one single paragraph, which is European security, where they uh, uh, bring forward the idea that uh, Russia is to depend on the blame on Russia, that uh, you know, and uh, uh, you and only can negotiate and have an agreement with Russia when Russia fulfills the Minsk agreements, and uh, I uh, probably am. Um, uh, anyway, outside of this uh, paragraph, uh, this clause, Russia is not mentioned anywhere, neither in partnership nor in any other uh, parts or concepts or clauses. Uh, so the foreign policy strategy, the European Union, remains an important partner of the Russian Federation. Is it a, a rigid answer, or is it a flexible answer, or... I, I believe that this is a realistic uh, response uh, with the understanding of the ways and means that uh, we can have in the future the anti-crisis strategy that we have to build and uh, where we have to go and how we're going to pursue our uh, or to fulfill our internal modernization in line with the Russia's interests. And uh, certainly certain uh, flexibility is desired but uh, following this Salisbury affair, and uh, which venues uh, 
uh, at which venues can Russia uphold its interests. This is one of the examples, but it describes the situation amply, I think. Your, your, your response is clear and evident. In any case, we have to adhere to a horse sense, to a common sense, and uh, because all the emotions, uh, uh, it would be wrong to say that um, we are uh, indignant, whatever. But you know, but it is in our strategic interests to. Uh, and so unfortunately, we are we are losing time. We we are out of time. Probably, I will add a little time to our discussion because although you want, all of you want to get to the. To the to the lunch, uh, but uh, meantime, uh, this is a very rare opportunity to listen to all the bright guests. I want to give the word to Mr. Sopran, and uh, because uh, it has been said many times that uh, the growing pressure on Russia and the um, aspiration to fulfill its uh, uh, to achieve its political isolation and to put it to the outskirts of. Uh, uh, the European road, and the thing that the West is pursuing its own interests, and what are the actual interests of Europe, and in the context of European interests, its relations with Russia, what should they be like? And one more additional question. Uh, are there any chances uh, to to sort of uh, to have this unified space from Lisbon to Vladivostok based on our common interests? No, I, I will. I will not let you know that uh, Europeans people dislike you or hate you. I think first it's a wrong idea, and second it's a dangerous idea. It's a wrong idea because um, uh, first it's a, it's a dangerous idea. Why? Because if it's true that European people dislike you, that means there is no escape uh, than war. There is no other issue. But thanks God, it's wrong. I mean, we are talking about a small and influent minority. We are talking about mainstream medias. We are not talking about the people of Europe. The people of Europe, they have nothing against Russia. You have to be sure about that. And I can tell you that as a politician, this is it's absolutely true. We are talking about pro-NATO forces. And these forces are, unfortunately, very strong within the European countries and European Union. That's true. But there is no fatality. We can change that situation for the future. I personally do not believe in Russophobia. Russophobia, it's just the effect of Hollywood. Because the day you will have Russian world movie with bad American guys, then you will change the opinion. So it depends on Russia. If Russia becomes a strong player in the globalization with its own system of entertainment production, things can change. There is no fatality about that. I don't think solution could be paranoia or isolation or North Korea way. I don't believe that. I think Russia has the keys in its hands to become a major player because you have so much creativity, so much very intelligent, smart people to be a player in this globalization that there is no fatality regarding the NATO global strategy to contain your country and to uh, make the people uh, in Europe being sometime against you. So just be, please do not believe that there is a fatality of war because that could be very dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Soprat, and for your assurances, too. Thank you for your assurances that you give us a bit of optimism that not everything is really as, as bad as we think sometimes, or that you indeed is a politician that has been elected by the people and who will communicate with the people. You, you see many things uh, from a different angle, of course, from a different perspective. In time, I would not uh, be excessively optimistic about all that, because uh, the um, current uh, scandal uh, based on uh, Skripal case, uh, uh, so many diplomats have been uh, uh, ousted from the country. About uh, 200 people on the other side uh, were also 
uh, and uh, this uh, we have never seen so many people sent out of the country. It was uh, it was happening uh, on the eve of the war. You see, it is. Uh, if it is performed by irresponsible people. In this case, we have to ask why hundreds of uh, dozens of states, uh, over 20 countries, uh, uh, sort of agreed to do that. Uh, do they have irresponsible politicians uh, who rule these countries? And uh, do we have to look at this uh, case uh, as a fatal, uh, fatal th threat? Uh, I'm not objecting to you, actually, but you know what? what I, I also want to become an opt to be an optimist. But uh, at the last moment, the situation has gone too far, and it's becoming overly perilous. And uh, it uh, causes us to think and to look for the way out of the situation, because it's further development, further aggravation and escalation can lead to, to a total, total erosion of our concept of friendly relations, uh, friendly attitudes toward each other. It would be belligerent uh, uh, relations that we uh, would be staying at. I would like to also like to, to Alexander Rar to, to, to address the following aspect. As you would remember, in the, in the past uh, Cold War, its uh, German leaders uh, had a major role to play in, a, in, a, in a dialogue between um, uh, for the for the sort of uh, relaxation of tension internationally, and in spite of the opposition of two countries, there were such uh, countries as Willy Brandt and uh, Schmidt, and uh, you know these people, you know these names, and uh, and uh, many projects uh, were developed uh, during the Cold War and during the boycotts that were predicated on the war in Afghanistan. Uh, the uh, the gas pipeline was uh, being built from West Siberia to Europe. Uh, at the time, and uh, and uh, there were political initiatives, and uh, business elites of Germany were also supporting that issue. Um, uh, can, can Germany today become the uh, the um, initiator of uh, establishing or re-establishing good relations? Okay, there are lots of politicians uh, who really want to, to do that. Uh, I, I fully subscribe to what my colleague from France said, that we have a soft force. And uh, we should not think about the James Bond movie now. We have uh, uh, a bad guy from, the, from, the, from Russia and a good guy from, from the West. And it would be like a comic strip, you know, it's, uh, and it will change relations to Russia. Let me put it this way, uh, deplorably. I represent the old Russian immigration, but uh, I really experienced pain that uh, uh, during the years, I'm talking the 70s and the 80s, at that time Russia was respected and the Soviet Union was feared and respected and tried to negotiate with Russia. And today Russia is trampled underfoot. Nobody respects for Russia. He respects for Russia because uh, this is, I'm, I'm speaking very rigidly, but rather I put it, put it plainly and straight, you know, and I also have a lot of pain when I when I speak about that experience, pain when I speak about that. But they do not recognize. They believe that Russia lost the Cold War, and uh, many people believe that uh, all the young people in Russia do not want to follow Putin. That they want to go back to Europe. That the 1990s was the sacred years for Russia, when it was adhered to freedom and democracy. And then some bad guys came, different guys came, and they began to leave it back to medieval ages. And uh, this is what many people believe. I also studied in a Western school in Munich and Frankfurt, and uh, the understanding of um, the Second World, World War was, uh, was, uh, was won, and uh, how Germany was defeated and the process that followed they are ascribed to Americans today, that America, Americans liberated Germany, Americans won the Second World War, and uh, allegedly Americans lost uh, uh, about uh, 400,000 people during the war, and uh, Russia 27 million. Uh, but nobody knows exactly how many people were lost because uh, we don't have a clear hi histori historic historiography for that. And so the Americans are good guys. You know, they occupied the Germans and they turned Germans into into very obedient Europeans, and they um, created this elite. The South Force speak about that. If you ask any pol politician or journalist, at the beginning I was working for the Freedom uh, Liberty radio station. 
he is sent to, 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 to America, he goes to Europe, he is, um, he, he, he is lectured at universities, he is accepted various clubs and organizations, so then he comes back and uh, he will uh, always uh, have a commitment to the American way of life, which is so beautiful. But uh, Russia, I only can give advice that my uh, French colleague had to say that we really have to create centers of soft power and to attract more and more people from Europe so that, indeed, in that regard, Russia could become attractive. Uh, and the last proposal I want to make, and then I will finish, I can see major Russian institutes, think tanks, whatever, and, uh, and my, my friend Dmitry also addressing him. They also do not want to lose the West. And uh, so Mr. Kartnov, I want to emphasize what he says. He also speaks to us and he writes to us and the Western institutions and they, they want to be friendly. The Russian Western institutions want to be friendly with American and German and French and think tanks that, uh, they, that uh, play in a high level. and. Uh, they have a lot of vanity and uh, they have to present themselves. They want to be loved and admired and they're, that's what they want to achieve. But I also believe that we have to work with the people who are sitting at this table with the other institutions that uh, also need uh, a very close cooperation with Russian academic circles and uh, Russian universities for this matter and non-NGOs and uh, who try to show a different alternative point of view in contrast to what is happening in the world. Thank you. Okay, I want to make an advertisement announcement because attached to the issue, none of a chance that uh, such a thing uh, occurs that Americans took advantage of the situation and they turned it into a comic strip and uh, and they uh, kind of diluted uh, all that away the public opinion. You speak about the information war, but uh, you also have to understand that the attempts of Russia to play by the same rules are um, sort of, uh, they are opposed, and uh, there is no symmetry as a result. And uh, the, what I want to, to, to promote in the same hall after the lunch, we'll have uh, a discussion on information war. And some of the participants of this panel will also be taking part in that uh, second part. We don't have much time for, for lunch. And uh, I did not, I did not fulfill my promise to give a floor to everybody twice. But in conclusion, I would like to ask uh, somebody who opened uh, this uh, discussion, uh, Dmitry Borisovich, uh, based on the, uh, on the discussions that we have had, is there any chance of Russia to have a play, uh, an active role in the formation of the world, uh, of the new world order, and uh, what Russia ought to do, and do we have enough resources for that? Just uh, conclusive remarks we would like you to make. Thank you. I would like to join all the all the speakers, and I want to agree with everybody. Uh, whatever they have said, it is very important, very interesting. As regards your query, I uh, apparently well, what world order? What is all about? Uh, this is internal situation, and domestic situation in all the uh, leading players and. Uh, um, the organization of life and whatever, and uh, how it reflects on the international arena. In Russia, if, if you have a powerful economy in Russia today, if you have powerful development of uh, technological development in the, with the preservation of the, the uh, moral sphere, with the preservation of all the values and the uh, principles, uh, which are laid in the foundation of our picture of the world or view, vision of the world. In this case, it will be a very important factor for for the uh, construction uh, of a new world order that will also that will include uh, Potsdam and Yalta. И тут мне кажется будут уместны и проявление мягкости, проявление какой-то компромиссной работы, но и проявление жесткости. И, и вот здесь я хотел обратить внимание на роль, которую сыграла и выступление известного Владимира Владимировича Путина перед Федеральным собранием, 
и доктринальные российские документы, в которых достаточно жестко ставится вопрос о реакции России в случае неприемлемых для нее шагов со стороны сказать, тех, кто видит в России препятствия на пути к мир... на установлению нового мирового порядка. Очень хорошо говорили коллеги о том, как, как выглядит вообще новый мировой порядок так сказать, в Европе и что они хотят увидеть во всем мире, рай без Бога. Да, это сплошной гедонизм, красивая действительно оберточная обертка, на самом деле абсолютно нереальная так сказать, вещь, но к этому стремятся, много делают. И, конечно, для того, чтобы заставить весь мир принять такую вот оберточную картинку и жить по нему, главное, так сказать, со всеми реалиями вот этой картинки, я думаю, что здесь нужно, так сказать, быть очень внимательным и следить за тем, что делают наши, так сказать, партнеры в кавычках. Они очень серьезно настроены, я бы не стал преуменьшать опасность конфликта, и в том числе крупного, достаточно вооруженного конфликта, крупного для того, чтобы сказать, поставить вопрос о том, что вот они победили, если они победят в этом конфликте. И теперь можно спокойно устанавливать вот этот иде идеалистический, так сказать, э и гедонистический новый мировой порядок, по поскольку каждый раз какой-то мировой или региональный порядок устанав устанавливался после войны вооруженного конфликта. М мы возьмем э Вестфальский мир, пожалуйста, 30-летний, там, и 50-летняя война. Мы возьмем э, Версальский мир. Ну, не удалось построить какой-то мировой порядок, но первый, Первая мировая война завершилась вот в Версальский мир. И Ялтинско-Подзамский. Что нас ждет сейчас? Ну, э, надо просто внимательно читать заявления наших э, британских так сказать, партнеров, так скажем, с юмором в кавычках. Но... В заявлениях госпожи Мэй и господина Джонсона сказано, что значит, они оценивают ситуацию следующим образом, вот эту, 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 ситуацию в Солсбери, что произошло нападение на э, члена НАТО, и это уже затрагивает статью 5 устава НАТО. И военная, то есть состоялась, фиксируется факт, это очень важно иметь в виду. И второе, уже, так сказать, в связи с фиксацией этого факта, фиксируется право Великобритании на, э, на самооборону в соответствии с статьей 51 Устава ООН. То есть мы в результате, да, да, завершая в результате ситуации с инцидентом в Солсбери, пришли к такому состоянию, как когда Великобритания явно совершенно при согласии Вашингтона и, может быть, при подсказке Вашингтона, значит, практически за, зафиксировала очень опасную ситуацию. Дальше наши партнеры могут так сказать, играть уже в какие-то другие и игры, очень опасные. И я хотел бы сказать, что это говорит о том, что мы вступаем в судьбоносное время, очень судьбоносное, не только для России, но и для всего мира. Спасибо. Спасибо. Мой опыт модерирования мероприятий в рамках Московского экономического форума приучил меня к тому, что вот надо как-то вытягивать конец мероприятия обязательно на оптимистическую ноту. Но сегодня состоявшееся обсуждение не дает для этого шансов, хотя это и не пессимизм, это нота тревоги. Я думаю, что все сидящие за этим столом именно потому здесь и находятся, что они испытывают тревоги по поводу происходящих событий, по поводу разрушающихся конструкций стабильности, по поводу разрушающихся, устоявшихся векторов развития человеческого сообщества. Вот. И в этом я вижу 
осторожный оптимизм. И продолжая то, о чем сказал Александр Арт, да, и, и правительственные организации. Московские экономические форумы – это не правительственная организация, которая пытается свою лепту внести в э, поиски ответов на самые ключевые вопросы жизни как нашей страны, так и мира в целом. Я считаю, что сегодняшний круглый стол однозначно успешен. Очень интересные выступления ораторов. Я благодарю всех собравшихся в этом зале за то, что вы нашли возможность пересидеть, а также и прежде всего наших ораторов. Давайте еще раз их поблагодарим за то, что они приехали к нам, нашли возможность здесь выступить. До свидания.